Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate uh, Dr. Sugarman, you uh, getting us started uh, by giving us some historical context and uh, some very important uh, information about uh, about health literacy and and its and its importance in society. And Linda, terrific uh, work with you and your team on on the commission paper and particularly the infographics. Um, so, questions and comments for this panel at this point. Okay, Cindy. Um, terrific presentations, both of you. Um, I've been um, working recently on moving from the ARC toolkit for informed consent and authorization for minimal risk research to a set of trainings for hospital staff for, for clinical practice. And um, I'm getting bogged down in some of the practicalities of how we might do this. So, Jeremy, you had, you know, given an example of um, a research study where uh, they were going to try different anesthesia. Um, and let's say it's not a research study. Let's just say you're coming in for surgery and, you know, you're, the anesthesiologist comes in. Very often when surgery is scheduled or when you discuss possibility of surgery with your physician at the first place, you don't know who your anesthesiologist is going to be. And I recently had a situation with my father where um, he was very concerned about the anesthesia and the doctor's first response was, well, that's the anesthesiologist. And then our response was, well, we can't make a decision about whether or not to have this surgery unless we know something about that. And then he said, Okay, well, the, the standard is to use a, a regional anesthetic, not a general. Then when we went in for the surgery, that was general was what was listed in, in the procedure, and then the anesthesiologist came, you know, and it's, it is that point where both of you identified as being a very sensitive um, time where you're pre opt where generally that discussion with the in, expert in anesthesiology takes place. So what are, what are some of our ideas of how, how this can work better? You know, you're highlighting a, a problem, a structural problem in the healthcare organizations and how they're um, approaching this issue for need to increase efficiency of the, of the health delivery system. So I, I think you did the right thing, but you, you demonstrated some of these. You were empowered enough. You um, asked the right question. You knew you were going to face the question, and you seemed to be prepared to have that set of conversations, even in a rush circumstance, just from the little bit that you're telling me. Um, ideally, what you do is have the opportunity to meet with an anesthesiologist or in a, in a sort of pre-op clinic, which several places do. Um, at, at Hopkins, we have that opportunity, for instance, where you can actually meet, may not be that anesthesiologist of the day, but at least you're meeting with a member of the, the staff who can go through the different options and communicate those preferences. Sometimes life life happens without the ability to plan. You know, people. I, I see patients on Tuesday mornings. Not all my patients can get sick on Tuesdays. I wish they would, because it'd be easier for them and for me if I saw them on Tuesdays. But but it doesn't. So if they come in a different day, there's going to be a different process. So not all of healthcare can be planned. I think there are some structural issues that if you're engaged in sort of teaching and you're identifying a policy problem or or a structural problem, that the focus should be on fixing the structure rather than trying to correct it with a consent process at the end. Thank you both so much for um, getting us going on this. So I, I wanted to put you a little bit on what I think is a little bit of a sticky issue and ask for you to help us with um, moving forward with some clarity on it. So in, in, uh, in getting with the importance of informed consent and in, and in obtaining it, we're trying to avoid conflict of interest and make whatever conflict of interest there is apparent to the people who are offering their consent for all the reasons that, that you've outlined. So what I wanted to know is as we, as, as that, that is part of our intent as we move forward, and we focus on what it is people really need to understand and know in order to give their informed consent. How do we approach potential conflict of interest in the process itself? So for example, with the use of new technologies, which might be able to enhance enrollment 
which might be able to cut the cost of very expensive clinical trials, which really do offer new approaches to doing higher volume clinical research as budgets are restrained. Um, the technology is a path into that, but the technology is supported with what could by some be conceived as a conflict of interest. So can you help us think about from the consumer patient enrollment perspective how we approach the process itself and potential conflicts of interest about getting informed consent? I think you know what I'm talking about because you're nodding your head. So yeah, so you raised uh, several issues um, and let me um, just try to unpack them a little bit. Um, I'm going to build a little bit of this on some work we did at NIH-funded study um, called COINS, Conflict of Interest Notification Study. Once we figured out the title, we knew we were going to get the grant. Um, but um, the, the issue there was we knew that we wanted to, everybody that had body, institutional body that has looked at the issue of conflicts of interest in research has said disclose it. Um, disclose the conflict as a, as a first step for, for um, working through the issues. But what's not clear is who should disclose it, when you should disclose it, where you should disclose it, how you should disclose it, and what effect it'll have on the research enterprise and potential participants. And COIN was um, aimed at addressing those questions. There's a huge body of literature, and I'm not going to go on too long. Just punch me if I just, uh, or hold up, oh, Melissa left with the sign. But, okay, good, good, good. Just, 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 just be, be, be our, but um, the bottom line is, so we summarize this in a New England Journal of Medicine article about what we learned over the course of a series of projects, policy reviews, interviews with institutional officials, interviews with investigators, focus groups with potential participants, vignette studies of potential participants using different scenarios of, of different uh, types of research settings, and um, then a, a, a simulation uh, computer-based to see if the, there was verisimilitude of, of practice. And basically what we learned is that most people don't care about most um, financial interests in research, in spite of the attention that's brought to, to issues. The only things that, that matter, and we're really truncating this and it's at, at, at the risk of sending the wrong message, um, but people do care about equity interests in research. So if you have sort of a, if an investigator is paid by a company to do research, if there's a per capita payment, um, people in general, the general public understands that money changes hands to do different kinds of research. And the fact that researchers do this or doctors do this is not surprising. It's only surprising when you live in uh, the rarefied uh, world of the university, that money doesn't change hands. Um, and so that's a sort of a very funny process. Equity interests bother people. The fact that the results might be contingent on your, how the uh, investigator or physician interprets things matter to people. And so when we looked at this, we came up with template language that was based on the way people talk about it. It's all out there and available to use to get at the issue of conflict. Um, if you think about it, we're saying, what are, what are we trying to protect people from? And how might a conflict affect the integrity of the research process or the welfare of participants? And it really is only those sort of equity interests that pose a risk. It's not any transition of cash. And so I think we have to be really careful about that. Sometimes when we're talking about conflict of interest, we're talking about conflicts of obligation, um, not conflicts of interest. What it, do I have joint obligations? Do I have an obligation to the integrity of the research process versus the obligation of the patient? Um, and that's uh, where attention comes out. So I would refer you to that literature to take a peek at that. What I want to say about this other thing about whether or not a particular technology would be viewed by a consumer, I don't know. Um, but it's an empirical question that ought to be asked. Um, one of the things that, through my work, my own research takes me to trying to practice evidence-based ethics. And um, what I did in that case is actually do trials of things like consent. So what we were interested in doing is we had a way of improving the quality of informed consent. And there are no shortage of solutions in the literature. They're all out there. Um, we figured out we wanted to measure the quality of the informed consent process. How do you do that? And um, so in order to do it, Phil Lavori and I got together and we put together something called the BICEP, the Brief Informed Consent Evaluation Protocol. And what the BICEP does is a way to measure the quality of the informed consent process took us 632 interviews with people to do this. What we wanted to make sure we were doing was measuring the consent process itself and not confound it with the experience of a participant in research. The person who's obtaining a consent couldn't be the person um, measuring consent because we're all above average and our jobs and life is sort of predicated on doing that. The results had to be confidential. 
uh, and we had to be independent. So uh, given that, we came up with a way of uh, using a phone bank. And so after a person obtained consent, immediately after obtaining consent, they would call the phone bank and they'd go through a process that maps to the conceptual model I showed you. And we found that there was actually room to work. We then did a randomized trial, site randomized trial with about 1,000 patients at 50 sites of a way that we thought would improve consent. It was basically a checklist that if you give people, um, train people in informed consent, and you say, most people who obtain consent say, I've never been trained. Now that I know this, I could obtain better informed consent. So we tested that in a site randomized trial. And we called that um, Equic SM self-monitoring. And it turns out that at the end of the day, this great idea that experts agreed would be a great idea, a checklist, that all the research coordinators agreed was a great idea. They complete this checklist after everybody obtained consent and faxed it in. They had like 90 plus percent compliance with the checklist. It didn't work. And the reason you don't know about it is it didn't work. So it couldn't get it published out of a small regional medical journal published out of Boston. It published in clinical trials, but it doesn't work. And what was really critical about that is when you hold consent to the same standards you'd hold any kind of drug or intervention to, and you test it rigorously, you can do that, first of all. And second is great ideas are sometimes wrong. And so I would suggest before anybody announces anything, I'm so humbled by that project, took years of my life, I used to be about six foot three. Um, it didn't affect me at all. Um, but the issue is, is that when that, when you test it, you really learn that it's harder to get it right because the, the process is so complicated. So, sorry about the. Linda, did you want to make a comment? Um, I just wanted to say that the research sort of supports what Dr. Sugarman is saying. One thing is, first of all, well, actually, he's cited all over the paper because of all of the work he's done in this area. But a lot of, going back to your original question, too much information has been found to be negatively associated with participation. So if you give too much, it actually increases confusion, and it makes people not want to participate in trials and gets them more nervous. And so sometimes this conflict of interest information becomes in that level of too much information if it's beyond what they really need to know. All right. So we've got, we're going to have to shorten up the questions and the responses because we've got a number of people that want to make comments. So that would be, that's good. But I think I'm going to start with Kim and work my way around. Kim? Thank you very much, both of you. Excellent presentations, and I appreciate you getting us started today. So I want to applaud um, the work and the comments and, and really just stress the importance of um, engaging actual consumers and doing human-centered design when we are creating um, and you know, piloting uh, these different efforts and, and all of our work that's going on to try to improve on our existing state. And I think that uh, understanding, you know, so even with the, uh, the model that you've presented, you know, vetting that with consumers, ideally having them in on the co-creation of that model, but now iterative testing and vetting with consumers in real time, not you know, over six months to see how it's working, but, you know, uh, in a couple of days, right, uh, to vet this with them. It, that'll include the appropriate steps, make sure that the appropriate steps and the language that meets the consumer need uh, is embedded in here. So, um, thank you. Just to uh, try to be quick, um, uh, in cases where this sort of risk profile of the research matters or you suspect there's something on, I agree that you really want to use all your tools. Bring out that whole toolkit that you have and use it to develop a sound consent process. So risk is high, stigma is high, confidentiality is important, communication is going to be difficult. There's other types of research where it doesn't matter quite so much, right? So I think we want to use our tools and our resources because these are very resource intensive. We did vaginal microbicide trials among sex workers in uh, West Africa to test a vaginal microbicide to prevent HIV print transmission. The stakes were enormous, right? And we made sure that we did really careful formative research to figure out how we could communicate to people who had less than four or five years of education in a six-arm randomized trial of different gels. So the IRB said, talk about a coin flip. Well, they don't use coins. Right? So what do you think about? 
And uh, we ended up using a 15-page consent document, but there were only three sentences per page, and we used pictures. And when we got to randomization, after doing it with formative research, we used two dice, and during the consent process, the person obtaining consent would take out a die. The woman was so happy to be talking about um, a dice game instead of um, her vagina, a microbicide, and HIV. Imagine that. And she takes out this die and says, did you get four? Or what'd you get? And the woman says, four. Roll it again. Did you get four again? No. I got two. You know I wouldn't get four again. And with two or three rolls of a die, people without education could understand randomization and masking. Right? So it's not that hard, provided you take it. How you communicate, where does the gel go? Right? And how do you use an anatomical model? What's the right anatomical model to use? When they were, first went out to get the anatomical model for this trial um, in Africa, they found that the only available anatomic models were white. It is not fashionable to have a white labia in Africa, right? So the thought would be, if you put the vaginal microbicide, would that turn my vagina white, right? So, so just having the discussion, no, it wouldn't. So the anthropologist we were working with at that time got a separate email account, got a separate credit card on government funds and bought a black labia, pasted it on the anatomical model, and they used that one. And that was, by the way, the time that TSA was first doing their screenings, and she thought, oh, I wonder what's going to happen if they get my bag. But anyway, you can use them, but it's expensive, time-consuming, important, and you should save all those tools and use them at those front end for those kind of projects. Um, thank you very much. This is um, a, just wonderful presentations. Um, I, just, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, the first one is regarding the commission paper with the examples of best practices. There was uh, uh, one of the, the points you mentioned was regarding addressing cultural and language differences. And so my question is if you could provide clarification regarding culture, is that if that's limited to race, ethnicity, and language, or is it, for example, adolescents have their own culture, our aged community has its own culture. And then my other question is regarding the, the research that has been done, um, were, did you, if you would um, speak to perhaps any accommodations that are made with individuals who are visually impaired or have other challenges where being able to read the consent is not their first option for whatever reason? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the cultural and language differences and research in that area did in fact rely on differences according to ethnicity, race, um, age was a little bit where there was sort of a cultural differences in terms of older adults. But um, I would say, like many areas of study, they haven't broadened the understanding of cultural differences yet in the research that we found. Um, so no, we didn't find it where adolescence was considered a cultural difference, for example. Secondly, um, in terms of accommodations, there, was a few study, there were a few studies that looked at, for example, visually impaired and other um, situations. A um, uh, couple studies were, for example, with patients with schizophrenia, a couple patient, um, certainly with significant um, dual eligible uh, participants who were um, in their 80s and older. And what the findings tend to show is that verbal communication seems to be ranked as the best way to communicate. But I think what researchers and authors are showing is it's the one-to-one -one interaction in that verbal communication that's the effective part of it. It's because the person can ask questions and can ask you to slow down and can ask you to repeat or you can ask them or see their nonverbals in terms of understanding. And that seemed to really increase comprehension more than the other modalities. My question is for Dr. Alduri. Linda, I'm going to follow up the prompt that you made in your talk. Talk to us for a few minutes for the, on the record, even though I know it's in your paper, about some of the major gaps in research that you uncovered. Sure, great. Thank you for the question. I'll pay you later. <laughs> OK. I have them here. Just want to make sure I get them all. Okay, 
Um, one significant gap that we actually found what was the lack of um, models that visualized anything. We found no visual models of any kind. We found a lot of templates and step-by-step -step directions on certain things, but we found a lack of infographics or sequential ordering to help people who might be at the beginning stages of understanding the informed consent. So Dr. Sugarman has years of experience, but a lot of people may be doing clinical trials for the first time, or they are residents, or others who really don't have the experience and expertise to know what they are doing. So we found very little research trying to develop models that can be tested. Secondly, we found little work done on the role of situational factors, such as risk levels, and how that affects informed consent. We found many essays and conclusions from studies that said, oh, risk level, that's probably a real dependent factor on how much we should communicate. But we haven't actually found any empirical studies looking at those factors and their effects. Third, um, the research on the new technology and multimedia. Frankly, we were a little surprised at how mixed the findings were because we're, we go into this like many people which think, oh, new technology must be the best thing since sliced bread. But actually, the findings are not panning that out. It's really dependent on your audience and the participant characteristics. Fourth, little research on actually low health literate populations. In most studies, when they measure health literacy, the findings show among the low health literate sample, little effects were proven. But nothing has actually focused on low health literate populations. And last, there was a, a dearth of studies on community-based research settings. Clinical studies, clinical trials, surgery, and diagnostic procedures were over 90% of the studies that we found. And we found over 120 studies. The interviewees, however, were really um, pushing more research and community-based research because they did community-based research and had few models and findings and examples to help them look at how to do informed consent. Thank you for that question. Bernard? So both of you uh, mentioned, obviously, from the health literacy point of view, the issue of too much information. And yet, well, often we're sort of, and I'm thinking more in terms of procedures or surgery, not necessarily research, although it could apply there too, we're, we're often uh, at a, in a quandary as to how much information to give regarding risks, especially. You know, in my career, I have seen three kids die during a tonsillectomy, mostly from anesthesia uh, reactions. Uh, so on the other hand, in giving and uh, asking in, in a risk of tonsillectomy, <coughs> do I always, always mention risk of death from anesthesia, which, you know, is real. But that's just an example of one gets into uh, going down a road of thinking about so many risks that are to some degree real but rare. How, do, from the ethical point of view and maybe from the practical point of view, how does, how does one make a decision to draw yourself back from the ledge of too much information? It's been a perennial issue um, and to know what the disutility of information is and, and, and also to assume that the, the amount of risk or, or benefit information for that uh, matter uh, is going to be the same for all people coming to the situation. I may see one person who comes to, to clinic who has more information about what their disease or condition is, has read about it so much that I can't keep up, and in the other hand, some people who are completely uh, uninformed about, about what's going to happen to them, and it's a different sort of um, challenge to meet. Um, the sort of, um, the, the bottom line is sort of the big, the, the big things that matter to most people, death kind of matters to people, you know, or most people, or should. Um, and um, major, major risks are things that need to be on the, on the table. Um, people have talked about the idea about uh, you sort of clicking down into more and more information, and making information available to people if they want to hear more. Um, sort of coming up with a bulleted list of main items and has been uh, one proposal that's been made, and then additional information um, put behind it. Uh, Amy Cornelia and I are involved in a, process, a project right now where uh, we've realized that the informed consent documents for um, HIV prevention trials funded by the NIH are uh, 
ridiculous. I mean, they're 20s or 30 pages. It takes a day for people to go through the consent document. Um, they come from villages. People walk uh, through 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 villages called Baltimore or in Malawi. It doesn't matter where. Um, they're coming and they're they're spending a day of their time going through this consent process and maybe understanding taking little from it. So what we're trying to get at is how can we shorten consent documents? So you, we know that they're non inferior to. Uh, we know short our, uh, consent documents are not inferior to long documents. You know, if that's the case, and there's other factors that make long consent documents a problem, um, how can we shorten those? And we hit a bunch of structural barriers, right? Even as the video mentioned, all the institutional constraints, the lawyers get in it, the HIPAA regulations, people start filling things in. I want to make sure I meet the federal regulations so I don't get dinged. And all of a sudden, you have a lot of, a lot of noise and not a lot of signal. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out is by asking all different stakeholders in the process what could be successfully eliminated from the consent form and why and see where we can reach consensus rather than just say, let's get rid of this extra language. So I evaded your question slightly. Um, but things that matter to all people, things that would matter to this person are the kinds of risks. Um, and, and in the ethics literature, you would talk about, uh, remember a long time ago, whose life is it anyway? Um, the idea of, of what does it mean to a musician if there's a 1% chance of peripheral neuropathy or ototoxicity of using a particular agent that are very commonly used, most people would err on the side of you know, their life and the better agent. But if you're a musician and you didn't have use of your fingers or your ears, that matters even more. So the big ones, what matters to you as a person, the subjective kind of standard and going from there. And I, I don't know this area at all. I can only speak to what I saw in the research that pertains to this area. And two things come up right away. One is this idea of giving people time. <clears throat> I think one of the fears that people feel is because they're told risks when they're about to go into the surgery. And they may have some vague understanding of the risk and benefit, but if they have to make that decision, they frankly <coughs> feel like they don't have a choice anymore. And that increases their fear. So that ahead of time. And um, there's a lot of misinformation as well. So the other problem with not sharing some of this information is people are going to go online and get wrong information and co-construct meaning beyond what you want to tell them. So by giving them the information ahead of time so they can judge through and navigate the other information they're getting, it may be the time factor rather than the content that matters. And that uh, brings up a question that I have, actually. that. Uh, so in your appendix B, situational risk model, uh, Linda, um, sort of there's a nagging question in my mind about whether this is the sort of risk model that applies to everybody or whether there should be, a, to use marketing language, a segmentation of the audience, given your response to different people have different values on different outcomes. Um, and, uh, and is there an ethical question about providing people with different levels of information? Does a one-size-fit-all approach, is that equitable yet not helpful to a lot of the people? Uh, you know, it seems like there's a, a bit of tension there between different concepts in terms of uh, what you provide to people and yet tailoring the information to what matters to people given their levels of uh, situation, but quite frankly also perhaps their level of literacy. Can you help me with that kind of dilemma? Well, I'm smiling because actually the team and I had this discussion, exactly this discussion. Um, when we wanted to come up with visual models, we wanted to find a way to incorporate both the universal precautions approach and tailored communication approach, two philosophies, and actually in the paper I call them philosophies, both of which we find beneficial in the situation of informed consent. So we wanted the second model to include other situational factors, right? Remember this? And we could not visually, graphically figure out how to include both this sort of standardized level of what might need to be done, depending, not depending on health literacy, but also um, the health literacy varies, the cultural factors vary, the level of risk in the study vary. Okay, I'm a, now go draw that. <laughs> and we wanted a moving interactive model, frankly, to put it all in. Yeah. 
So I just, I don't have an answer. I just want you to know that I, the question's on the table. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's probably something that uh, out of this discussion we need to wrestle with beyond that. And that's an important kind of thing to walk away from the conversation with. Jeremy? So, so great. As, as you're working <laughs> through this issue, if you're not aware of it already, in the, le in the law, there's been an enormous debate about this issue of the cases that have led to consent in the clinical setting. And there are three standards for adequate disclosure of information during the consent process. Uh, there's a, a professional standard, a reasonable patient standard, and a subjective standard. The professional standard would be what, was, what would a, a profession, the average professional, give in this situation. So for the tonsillectomy, do most pediatric otolaryngologists say death or not? Do they say, uh, you know, your, your intake of, um, of ice cream and, and, and sherbet afterwards is going to be increased? You know, what, what do they say? Um, the other is what, is a re what does a reasonable patient want to know? Um, and the third is a subjective standard. What are the individual differences? Most courts have gone towards a professional standard because it's easier to haul in a bunch of professionals in a court setting where there's an allegation of improper consent. It doesn't mean it's the right way to go. It's the court doing its business. But that's, those debates over the right standard of adequacy of disclosure have been around for you know, 30, 40 years of consent cases. And you can look in that. In the research setting, and I, what I like about the model is um, the notion that all research is not created equal, right? So the phase one first in human study is a very different situation than the survey research staying. We're facing a lot of work. Um, another roundtable that uh, we're doing some work with is related to um, patient uh, comparative effectiveness research and, and the whole move towards comparative effectiveness research broadly. When you're going into a healthcare setting and you are going to be receiving uh, drug A or drug B, and it's just a matter of where you landed that day about whether your doctor uses B or A. And yet as, as a major matter, we're just trying to sort out using data that are already going to be acquired in the healthcare setting. The incremental risk of research is trivial or minimal. There's no incremental burden. Why consent? And what's, what's consent going to accomplish in that setting? And, and what standards ought we have there? And so there's a bit of a pushback now against always building up consent to be uh, the most important element. Now, I love consent, and, and so I think it's those situations I put on those other considerations that are driving those concerns. When are there other non-welfare interests or welfare interests or moral standards that matter to people to so help inform this decision? All right. Thank you. Bernie. Thank you. Linda, I really enjoyed uh, the content and read of the commission paper. Quite informative and helpful. One thing that seems to be uh, pervasive or uh, at least mentioned frequently throughout the paper is the perceived uh, federal re regulations as perhaps being too often leading to challenges that complicate the informed consent process. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, clinical research related to community health, benefits uh, related to the community. And uh, so uh, and in, that, in that sense, this is quite important, and we... Uh, utilize that often in our IRB. So I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit, are you referring to language or in, uh, the uh, uh, interpretation or intent? Could you clarify a little bit further about what you meant by that statement that's... Uh, the, restric the restrictions of <laughs> the, the FDA. No, the uh, concern the that uh, the federal regulations often lead to challenges okay. uh, in the informed consent process. It so revert... Um, we mainly refer to communication and language, the use of language, the number of federal regulations that is perceived as restrictive when I have to then communicate all these different regulations. So I do not think that it is anything in terms of structural or behavioral restrictions that the researchers feel. But how do I communicate all these things that I'm trying to, uh, you know, communicate from voluntariness to confidentiality to having to, who to contact and, um, oh, and then, you know, if I have anybody who's pregnant in my study, the additional risks that I have to suggest and that that could happen compared to the benefits. And so I think that it is how to communicate all the different things. Now, um, what we learned in studying the regulations so carefully is actually that, and that's where the second model comes up. There's a lot of stuff are optional. And I just don't know if everybody knows that. I think that there are some basic stuff 
that ethically you would know you need to communicate. But after that, it has to do with what your study is, what the risks are, and other factors. And maybe not a lot of people realize that maybe they're not as restrictive as they think, but it's mostly communication. But And then the other thing I just want to mention is the community-based um, work. Um, the paper does get into a couple best practices, but that's one reason why the example I used did these group meetings at first because it, they wanted to show this is a community decision, this is going to affect community, let's get you together and talk about how that happens. Winston. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to um, touch upon something that I think you, both of you, um, uh, referred to in your presentations, but just to see if I could surface it more explicitly. I was wondering with regards to the um, context of political power relative to the conversations around informed consent, particularly um, in the situation where uh, in, in various safety net organizations, you may have individuals who come in seeking care, maybe undocumented, certainly uh, on the margins of being insured. Um, how does that factor in in terms of uh, the conversations that really do take place? Have there been explicit studies have been done in those, those contexts in terms of weighing political power and coercion in the conversation of, of receiving consent and understanding consent? Um, unfortunately, the research has not panned out. In particular, our search really focused on health literacy and informed consent. So there is a much wider body of knowledge around issues of informed consent that did not address health literacy. And we did not include those because our focus was health literacy. So I don't want to suggest it's not out there. But what we looked at, it, we didn't find it within the context of health literacy. We did, and this, so to your question, we didn't find published research. But it was in the interviews that that came up. It was with the interviewees that they said what we have found with populations that we're working with that fall into these characteristics, we take the time, we meet them ahead of time, we provide them an understanding of what is informed consent before we ever even get into what is this study, to show them that it's about them. We talk about decision making. We don't talk about the content of the study, these kinds of things. Everything is in different languages. And a couple interviewees talked about pretty long battles with the IRB, but that they wouldn't back down because their populations were rural, low literate, these kinds of issues, and they would not back down. They became advocates of their populations, but they had a battle IRB. Uh, just uh, briefly, so again, the literature on the particular case, I'm not aware, I'm not, I'm not PubMed. But um, I, I don't know the particular research question, but I think that the issue highlights the critical issue of um, voluntariness um, and that it is one of the understudied areas of the consent process. So what, we, and I would add to your research claim, when you look at the studies of informed consent, our first literature review I think was almost 20 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, you probably have it cited where at that time there were 4,173 hypotheses that were addressed. And most of them were about understanding and disclosure. But o only a handful were about voluntariness. And if we really want to get to consent, we want to think about voluntariness. And so I would highlight those other areas. And the other way around this is, as a regulatory matter, if the only risk to the, so where the federal regulations give you leeway, if the only risk to the participant is a legal risk of, of signing the document, the document can be waived in certain times. So you, can, you don't have to necessarily document. So there are ways around it. It's a longer topic if required to, to uh, enhance the welfare of the participant. Lori? So I'm channeling a little bit of what Winston commented on, but more in a clinical setting versus a research setting. So thinking similarly about the same issues around um, voluntar voluntariness and decision-making capability, and, I, and Cindy's <clears throat> uh, discussion of her father, it's, it's rare in a safety net setting where I work to, the power differential is dramatic as it is in society, but certainly in those settings, and how we obtain informed consent in a voluntary manner in a procedure perhaps the patient would have never opted into anyway. So thinking about timing, 
um, patient preference, patient priorities as a driver to where we meet them in, from a health literate perspective. I'm wondering if you guys have looked at that again. It sounds like maybe not yet. And, and really, you know, emphasizing with this group the importance of nesting health literacy in a patient priority, uh, uh, power, power um, shared situation. And I, I did like, Linda, your, your, um, the family involvement and also that opportunity of group meetings, I think, is one way to help equalize that. But I wonder if you guys had seen other ways to. Um, no, and in fact, um, what was also striking is when people were actually studying health literacy, they focused on the literacy end of the health literacy definition and how people read and comprehended, where a lot of the work I do is in self-efficacy and empowerment and perceived control. And we only found one formalized empirical study looking at self-efficacy level. The question is whether you want to disaggregate your questions of power and literacy in that situation because the, the same situation around the globe when we do consent, people in power are obtaining consent if you're a doctor, a nurse, a researcher. So who obtains consent uh, may be a way around that issue, either for healthcare or research. It doesn't have to be the physician or the nurse. It can be uh, workers in other settings. And I think you can solve part of that problem and you still have the literacy issues to work with. Briefly, Cindy. Yeah, um, to Lori's point, I think that um, Jeremy had talked about the three standards that are used legally. One, the professional standard, what would a reasonable professional do? What would a reasonable person want to know? And the third is the subjective standard, which is what would make a difference to that individual? What would affect their decision? And that, I think, is really what you're getting to which is very difficult legally to enforce because how am I supposed to know what would have affected their decision, but is in fact what we should be striving for. And there is a model out there that says, you know, what we should be telling people is what is going to be important for them, that person, to make that decision. So I wanted to say that. And I just wanted to um, briefly comment, Jeremy, you made a few comments on short. Um, uh, forms, and one was about shortening a form, um, but the other one was a fantastic example where you had a 15-page form, but there were only three words on a page and uh, pictures, and to, to really, I think that very often people struggle to, you know, in, in the effort to simplify and make it more understandable, think that, that having short forms is a way to do that and that you've illustrated that that is, you know, page length is not a good measure. Um, and that potentially those forms you mentioned that people sometimes use them to go back as reference documents. And one other use that we haven't mentioned yet this morning, which is um, to guide the person who's conducting the consent discussion to make sure that they are in fact following um, you know, and in, in, um, communicating all those important pieces of information. Thank you. And Ruth, last comment. So just a quick question to both of you. I think I know yours, Linda, from reading the paper and seeing it, um, so, and I think it's about the models, but um, you can tell me if I'm wrong. But I'd like to hear both of you speak specifically to the top one or two zones within this issue. Um, that you think are ripe for the IOM Health Literacy Roundtable. It's big, but pick a couple. You're king and queen for the day. Thanks. Um, actually, I probably would not say the models necessarily. Um, I would like to have as my top pick the use of multimedia and interactive technologies. Because I'm finding the research so fascinating. People are using really out of the box creative ideas, like I mentioned from avatars to as simple as PowerPoint, but the findings are not resoundingly positive. So I really would love to have more dialogue and confirmations and to tease that out. Do you guys have a, what about you guys? What do you think? So um, I would, I'd pick up on this. I think the, the data are humbling. And we did a first project on um, patient, using patient activation and uh, then generation computer models to um, increase con uh, the quality of consent for phase one oncology trials. And we were 
first humbled about how hard it was, labor intensive, <laughs> resource intensive, and that it didn't work um, in the end. And I think, listen to the data. So what you're see hearing about this is we, we get, we, we appeal to these technologies. There's a lot going on in consent besides just this information giving and understanding. And so any model that reduces it prematurely to that simple question is gonna is gonna fail. So I'd, I'd, I'd uh, step one would be make it as complicated as it is and work on that problem. The second would be there's a, still a need for data before introducing any recommendations. That things that we think about in closed rooms without data can be hazardous um, and resource intensive. So a last uh, comment from me. Um, so um, <coughs> Dr. Sugarman, you um, mentioned earlier in the conversation about the fact that you, uh, that financial conflicts of interest didn't matter to patients apparently or something like, maybe I've got that wrong. Um, and I was wondering, given the fact that we've just done this workshop on numeracy, um, whether or not that, um, particularly given the you, fact that you changed your title of your talk to why we ought to care, um, I was wondering whether that, uh, that lack of concern about financial uh, conflicts, or if I've got this right, um, builds back to um, a lack of understanding in a lot of the public about how uh, numbers in finance work and how they can influence decisions. And I, I particularly have that thought coming from a meeting where I, I was addressing oncologists and pharmaceuticals about cancer care. Uh, and total cost of care. Uh, this really came up actually in terms of a lot of the issues facing end of life care and sure. over treatment and things like that. So I'm wondering, in, 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 should they be caring, I mean, to taking so, off of the title of your talk? So, ought they care about these things? Sure. And, so, and what's the challenge that we it, face it, in terms of, yeah, of addressing it's a, that? It's a great topic, and, I, and I'm sorry to truncate it so fast, but if it was that most patients don't care about most financial interests in research, but they did care about equity interests. So even people in these uh, across a broad range of abilities to um, to understand the information, um, all sort of centered in on this issue of equity. So they understood the notion of an equity interest. They wouldn't describe it as an equity interest. I don't even really know what an equity interest is. I mean, I, I'm a doctor, so you know, investing people come and, and take us take advantage of us all the time. Um, but the the issue seriously is is that they got the idea of equity and they got it rather quickly in discussion. But the idea that money would change hands, right, with the things that we disclose, the fact that a, that a doctor or a nurse or a hospital receives money to conduct a clinical trial didn't seem to matter to them. And I don't think that's, I don't know if it should matter. So the question is really if it is something that pose, uh, poses a, uh, a threat to their welfare, then it should matter. So um, I think the dominant paradigm for discussing conflicts of interest is it's critical but I think we need to come up with management strategies for conflicts of interest in research rather than rely on the consent process to solve all the issues with it. Um, I'd refer you to our summary paper in the New England Journal of Medicine on the issue. And then uh, we have different uh, language that we came up with that, that um, IRBs and investigators can use to describe different financial interests that comes at understanding. And we've used it among thousands of people. So have a look at it and, and tell us we're probably wrong on some of it. It's just I don't know which parts are wrong. <laughs> I will take a look at it. This has been just a terrific start to this conversation. I want to thank you, Dr. Sugarman, for really setting up the conversation. And Linda, what a terrific job you and your team have done in terms of the paper as well as communicating these concept, uh, concepts to us. So my congratulations to you. So let's thank this panel. So let's, let's attempt a 15-minute uh, break till 25 after. Thank you.